today. Um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, if you have your uh, copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to join me there. If you don't, that's okay. Um, we've got some of those scriptures on the screen for you as well. Now, I know what you're thinking. Andy, we're working through the book of Acts. Last week, we were in Acts 13. Uh, you're backtracking to Acts 12. Uh, you would be absolutely right. Um, we just kind of did a two-week series on Antioch, so we had to look at Acts 11, and we had to look at Acts 13. And so today, we're actually going to uh, start a new journey together um, called the playbook. And kind of from this point on, we're going to look at really what is God's strategic plan for a life worth living, all right? It's kind of a mouthful, but that's kind of where we're, we're going to target each week for, for five weeks and uh, just looking forward to seeing how God uses this, uh, this message as we study um, the, book of, the book of Acts together. Now, a um, quick personal uh, something you can know about me. We have a rabbit um, in our house. He's called a free roam rabbit. Um, he is a lion head uh, miniature rabbit. Um, w- when we got him, he was miniature, but I think what they meant by miniature was baby uh, because he has grown into a full-blown uh, rabbit. He's a lion head because he's got fur like a mane. Um, and so uh, it, it was a gift to our oldest daughter, Allie, for Christmas. And so she affectionately named him Simba. And so if you come over to our house, um, it's not uncommon that you'll see a little uh, lion uh, just kind of uh, hopping across the living room. He's very social, loves to be around people, and he loves to hide underneath the couch. That's just kind of how God made rabbits. They kind of burrow and they find nests in dark places. And so um, Simba loves to kind of get underneath the couch, um, kind of hear what's going on, on with people around him. Um, and so when kids come over, they always like to look for Simba. And uh, I know underneath your couch, it's perfectly clean, okay? Uh, but underneath our couch, you know, it's, it's kind of one of the dirtiest spots uh, in the home. No matter what you do, underneath your couch is, is going to get going to get dirty. And so um, this has happened twice where a kid has crawled up underneath the couch and then after they're kind of looking at Simba and petting Simba, um, they start to come out and they realize they're stuck. And so I don't know what it is about our couch um, that a kid can get in um, but can't get out. In fact, one time we're having small group and there's about eight adults sitting in a circle, three adults on the couch and we hear I'm stuck. Help, help. And so dad kind of rushes over and literally lifts the couch up with like three moms sitting on the couch and, uh, and uh, lets, his son, lets his son loose. This past weekend, um, we had a, a young lady. In fact, I think the mom is sitting in the audience and we haven't told her the story yet. But uh, your daughter um, got stuck underneath our, underneath our couch. Um, look, I don't know, uh, uh, or I do know, I think we all can kind of relate to what it feels like being stuck. Anybody ever been stuck? Maybe, guys, you, you, you just thought your truck was going to make it through uh, the mud hole, but you got stuck. Um, you, you thought the ditch um, was going to uh, be enough to handle your riding lawnmower, but you got stuck. Uh, you thought your hand could fit in the small cookie jar, um, but it got stuck, right? I think we all know what it feels like to be stuck. What does it feel like? It feels helpless, right? When you are stuck... When you are trapped, you feel helpless. Listen, I, I'm going I'm to guess that in a room like this, that there's, there's probably several people, maybe, maybe a lot of people, um, you've gone through a season of life where you have felt stuck, where you have felt helpless. Maybe that situation revolved around, around your marriage. Uh, you, you feel like in, in your marriage you kind of keep coming back to the same argument and the same thing kind of keeps resurfacing and you just feel stuck. You feel trapped, okay, in this, uh, in this scenario. Or maybe um, you have a child that's kind of coming out of elementary into adolescence and we just sent a herd of them up um, out, upstairs. And so I know you got some parents that are kind of going through that adolescent stage and, and you feel sometimes as a parent helpless. You feel stuck or, or trapped. Maybe in God's calling on your life, you feel like God has, has given you a direction. He's given you a calling, uh, but you've gotten to a place in that where you just feel stuck. You feel trapped or you feel helpless, and you're not really sure where it's going to go from 
here. Anybody ever been there? All right, is it just me? I think we all can kind of relate to this. Well, in Acts uh, chapter 13, there are two guys that we find in this situation. They are stuck. They are trapped. In fact, they are trapped physically. Why? Because they're in prison. They're in prison. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you the rest of the story, and then we're going to kind of fill in the dots from from here to the end. Uh, But here's kind of how it ends. One of the guys named James is executed. One of the guys named Peter is released and set free. But let me tell you something. From the very beginning, here's what we need to know. Both of them were delivered. Both of them were delivered. It's not that God delivered one, Peter, and did not deliver one, James. No, both of them were delivered. When God delivers, it happens in his way and it happens in his timing. So even though it looks different between, even though the outcomes are different between Peter and James, we've got to go into this story realizing that both of these men were delivered. In fact, Paul would say this. He says, look, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Death is a promotion. (laughs) So as we read this, let's not dare go into the story and think, oh my goodness, poor James. No, if anything, we should probably say poor Peter. But he doesn't even seem poor because why? Because he's like, to live is Christ. Like if God delivers me by keeping me here, then guess what? I'll continue to live and serve him. But if God delivers me and brings me home, then guess what? That's a promotion. That's gain. So it's a win-win situation. But we've got to know this. God will always deliver. Okay, here it is. Acts uh, 12, beginning in verse uh, 1. About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church. And he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too. And during during the festival of unleavened bread, after the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned, watch this, four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. Why would he do that? Intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So here's kind of what's, what's going on. King Herod um, arrests a guy named James, um, has him executed. There is a group of Jews that celebrate that. They don't like this whole Christian movement. They, they're, they're trying to put to dead this whole um, talk about Jesus and as, as him being the Messiah and, and him being the Savior. And so there's a group of Jews that celebrate King Herod for what he did. So King Herod sees this as a political move. Hey, I've just impressed Some of the people, um, they're celebrating me. They are applauding me. So I'm going to give the people more of what they want. I'm going to arrest. I'm going to go straight up to one of the head honchos, one of the key disciples, one of the key influencers. I'm going to arrest Peter and put him in prison with the intentions of putting him to death. But he doesn't just put him in prison. What does he do? He puts how many squads of soldiers? Four squads of how many? Four soldiers. We homeschool, so here he goes. Four times four is what? 16. Very good. Star for you, right? 16. 16 soldiers. So here's a quick question. Who are you putting the odds on? If we were to, if, if we were to bet in church, okay, which we totally would not do, um, but if you were to put the odds on Peter, who is chained behind bars and naked, you might be thinking, how is he naked? We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later, all right? Peter behind bars, he's chained, he's naked, or 16 armed and dangerous, trained soldiers for the Roman army. Just be honest. Human perspective, don't give me your church answer, human perspective, who do you put the odds on? The soldiers. You put the odds on the soldiers. There's no way Peter is getting out of this one. But look, when we put on our spiritual eyes, we see things through the lens, of, the lens of with God all things are possible, who do you put the odds on? You put the odds on God, right? You put the odds on Peter. Here's something I want you to see today. In God's playbook, you're never trapped. In God's playbook, okay, you're never trapped. In other words, there is always, always, always a way out. So there may be times when you feel stuck. I want to encourage you today. (laughs) You're not stuck. 
you are moments away from deliverance. Just moments away. In God's playbook, you're never stuck. Look, it may feel like fourth and long, and your team is down by 15. But look, in God's playbook, (laughs) you're never stuck. Do you think God is ever in a moment going, huh, didn't see that one coming. What am I going to do here? I got to outwit the devil on this one. No. In God's playbook, you're never stuck. Now, some of your wheels might be turning. Okay, Andy, this is one story. Um, how, how, how confident are you to this? Look, I'm extremely confident. I'm extremely confident in this, not because of, of some special revelation I have from God, but because if we look at the, at the Old Testament, what do we see? All throughout the Old Testament, we see that God's people, and God has this nation of Israel that he interacts with to show uh, his care for the world. All throughout it, we see this. In God's playbook, we're never trapped. We're never stuck. Um, Let's kind of do a quick review. Um, Remember when Israel is living as slaves in Egypt, and it looks like they're trapped, it looks like they're stuck? Guess what? They weren't trapped. They were just moments away from deliverance. God sends a guy named Moses, rescues them, delivers them. They go out. They've got the Red Sea in front of them that they can't cross. They've got Pharaoh's army saying, "Uh uh-oh, let's go get them back, pursuing them from behind. Are they trapped? Are they stuck? No. They are moments away from deliverance and walking across a wet sea on dry ground. But it doesn't stop there. They get to the other side, and they start doing what? We're hungry. We need something to eat. We're trapped. We're stuck. We feel helpless. Are they stuck? No. What are they? Boom. They are moments away from deliverance. God providing food and nourishment for them. We can go on and on and on with this, can't we? Later on, when Israel has a king, King Saul, the Philistine army comes up and says, hey, we want to fight, but let's just fight one-on-one. We've got Goliath. Who do you got? Out of all of Israel's army, there wasn't one person with enough boldness and courage to go down and fight Goliath until a little boy named David shows up with his sack lunch for his brothers. And he says, who is that Philistine who defies the army of the living God? They were moments away from deliverance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you think they were trapped in the fire? Absolutely not. They were moments away from deliverance. I can go on and on and on. That's why you should read the Old Testament. I know you love hanging out in the Gospels about the life of Christ, but go back and read the Old Testament and see story after story after story reminding you that in God's playbook, you are never trapped. And let me give you the cherry on top. Remember in the New Testament, let's go to the end of that Gospel, all right? Let's go to the New Testament. They take Jesus, they crucify him, they stick him in a tomb, put a, uh, put a, a, a rock, a stone in front. They put guards all around it. You think Jesus is trapped? Turn to your neighbor and say, uh-uh, uh-uh. He is moments away from deliverance. And that is good news for us because through his resurrection, guess what? That resurrection empowers and offers us deliverance as well. So this is not just some some fancy make you feel good, deliverance is coming, keep being hard at it, you're doing a good job. This is based on the authority of God's word that in God's playbook, you're never trapped. Now you might be thinking, Andy, I... I don't know. I don't know about me. Let me show you a verse of scripture in Psalm 34, verse 7. It says this, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and what? And rescues them. You know what the word rescue means? It means delivers. I want to point this out that um, God is not like a 911 emergency phone call okay, that, that you call and, and he's on his way, okay, uh, let's, let me get there, I got some stuff going on in the Middle East I got to take care of first and I'll get to you in Georgetown, you know, when I arrive. No, he, he's not on the way, deliverance is not on the way. What, the angel of the Lord, he encamps around those who fear him. He is not far off, okay, why? And he, for those who fear him and he says and he, and he rescues them. So I want you to know that deliverance is not far away. And look, even if it's 30 years away, in the, in the scope of eternity, it is not far away. Now, some of you might be thinking this, Andy, I, I admit, I have seen God's deliverance. I have seen him deliver uh, me from a situation uh, in my past. But, the, I mean, I, I've got that one, and then I, I don't know if I'm going to get a second one. 
Look, God's deliverance is not a one-hit wonder. Okay, let me show you this verse from 2 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 10. It says, he has delivered us from such a terrible death, and he will deliver us. In other words, in the future. We have put our hope in him that he will deliver us, what's the word? Again. Listen, you've been delivered for, before, that's great. That should give you trust in the Lord. But guess what? He delivers again. And then he delivers again. And in case you need to hear it again, he delivers again. And you might feel trapped. You might feel like it's fourth and long. There's no way out. But listen, in God's playbook, we're never trapped. We're never trapped. So look, who delivers? God. How does he deliver? Buckle your seatbelts for this one, all right? How does he deliver? God delivers. I believe he delivers through prayer. I believe that God delivers through prayer. Here's what prayer is, all right? Prayer is the key that unlocks the door of deliverance. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because it's something you really need to reflect on in your life. Um, it's something I need to reflect on in my life. Prayer is the key that unlocks the door of deliverance. Isn't that a powerful truth? And here's the thing about powerful truth. When something's powerful, it can also be dangerous, can it? If you've got a weapon at home, it's powerful. You point it in the wrong direction, now all of a sudden it's dangerous. You can take this, and some people do, usually find them on TV late at night, and you can take this and you can point it in the wrong direction. Oh, prayer's the key that unlocks the door of deliverance. Well, thank goodness, I'm going to start praying for deliverance. Dear God, please deliver me from this truck payment. I truck broke down last month, and you know I needed a, a new truck, and I, and I had to have that, that platinum addition, Lord, because they were offering the free car wash. It was a deal I couldn't refuse. But Lord, I, I can't afford these payments. I'm stuck. I'm trapped. I don't see a way out. Have thine own way, Lord, in the life. Deliver thee from thy truck payments. Amen. <laughs> Is that what this means? No, that's, that's not what it means. But look, sometimes we, we say, well, if it doesn't mean that, then, then we've got to go all the way over here to the other ditch and say, well, prayer really doesn't matter. God's going to do whatever he's going to do, so what, what difference does my prayer make? Listen, if prayer doesn't make a difference, then why would Jesus give the model prayer? If prayer doesn't make a difference, why would Jesus start his ministry with 40 days alone with God in prayer? If prayer doesn't make a difference, why would Jesus end his ministry the night before he was crucified? Doing what? Praying. I mean, if, if I told you tomorrow is your last day, how many of you are like, let's live it up tonight then? Let's have fun. Maybe not even fun in a sinful way, but let's just, I'm going to get all my friends and we're just going to have a, a good old clean celebration right? That's kind of, that's, that, maybe that's just me. Huh? Maybe I just revealed my own sinful heart there. But Jesus says, no, 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 I need, I need to pray. So you look at the ministry of Jesus and what do you see? You see bookends of prayer. Not just at the beginning and the end, but you see a thread of prayer all throughout his ministry. So look, let's not because we don't want to fall into the name it, claim it trap, let's not forget the power of what the Scripture teaches us, that prayer is the key that unlocks the door of deliverance. Some of you, you're still on the fence. You're not quite convinced, all right? So let's go, let's go to more of the Bible, all right? You don't have to believe me, uh, but my question is, do you believe the Bible? In, in Mark chapter 9, uh, the disciples are going to cast out a demon, but they can't. So they bring this guy, this little boy, to Jesus. Jesus has a conversation with the dad, Jesus casts out the demon, he leaves, he delivers the young boy. And then afterwards, the disciples ask Jesus this question, how come we couldn't deliver him? We've cast out other demons. We've, we've displayed your power and your authority in other ways. And, and other times, what was different about this one? What, what, is, what was Jesus' response? And he told them, this kind can come out by nothing but, what's the word? Prayer. In other words, Jesus is saying, prayer is the key that unlocks the door of deliverance. In the Old Testament, uh, King Solomon built a temple. He dedicates that temple to the Lord. And then God comes on the scene in response and he says, oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, and by the way, you're gonna go through seasons of drought. 
You're going to go seas- through seasons of grasshoppers. <laughs> That's funny. You're going to go through seasons of pestilence and disease and viruses. And then, G- and then the Lord says this, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, and my people who bear my name, if they will humble themselves and what? And pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then, here's what I will do. I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. What God is saying in the verse before, he says, hey, look, you're going to go through seasons. I'm, I'm thankful that you dedicated this temple to me. I, re- I really am. But you're going to go through seasons of life that are out of your control. Anybody feel like 2020 is a, is a year is kind of out of out of control? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and we still have a few months left. You're going to go through seasons of life that are out of control. But if my people will just get through it, if my people will just grin it and bear it, no, no, no. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I'll forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. What's God saying? Prayer is the key that unlocks the door of deliverance. Let's go New Testament. Let's go to one of the epistles. Um, James writes a letter to the church and he says this to, to this early church, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another. Why? So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful in its effect. You know what a righteous person is? It's not a good person. He's not saying the prayer of a good person. The Bible says no one is good. But a righteous person is someone who's been saved, someone who's been forgiven, someone who has a right standing before God. So so James is saying, look, if you have a right standing before God, your prayers are very powerful and they produce an effect. They have a result. What's he saying? Prayer is the key that unlocks the door of deliverance. So Peter is in prison. We left him a long time ago. Let's kind of finish. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church, what were they doing? They were praying fervently to God for him. Listen, I'm going to give you two ways that you should be praying. All right? If you, if you feel trapped, maybe you're in there right now. Um, maybe you just came out. Maybe you're heading in. If you're stuck, you should pray. I'm going to give you two ways that you should pray. Number one, pray fervently. How did the early church pray for Peter who was in prison? They prayed fervently. Listen, not frantically. <laughs> this was not, oh my gosh, Peter's in prison. What are we going to do? What? Lord, you got to do something. We don't know what we're going to do. Here's winning. Well, they prayed fervently. What does the word fervently mean? It means you pray with frequency and intensity. Frequency is the consistency of our prayers, meaning it's not something we just pray once and we think, okay, well, I'm good. Well, God heard. He'll put it on his task list, and when he gets to it, we're good. No, we should pray consistently. In fact, Scripture says that we should pray without ceasing, meaning we should always be in an attitude of, of prayer. And you might think, well, I, I talked to God about that yesterday. What's the point of me talking to God uh, about that today? But listen, there's something powerful in persistence. In fact, Jesus told a parable about a neighbor who came to his neighbor, and he knocked on the door, and he said, I need some bread because we had some company just show up. Ever happen to anybody? And the guy says, Puh. We already put the kids to bed. It's an awesome parable. Go read it this afternoon. We already put the kids to bed. We locked the doors. We're asleep. And the the parable that Jesus tells is the neighbor's not going to give his friend bread because he's his friend. But he will give him bread if he's persistent. Tell you something. If you're knocking on my door from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m., probably by 1230, I'm like, here's your bread. Go home. There's something to persistence. There's something to frequency. Not that God forgets, but that it serves as a constant reminder for you. So we should pray fervently, not frantically. We should pray with frequency, but we'd also pray with intensity, meaning our prayers should stir within us an emotion. And I'm not saying you should be fake about it, okay? Don't, don't be, uh, have fake emotions. But, man, when you're praying fervently, there's, there's joy that comes out in that prayer. Or there's grief that comes out in that prayer. There's weeping that comes out in that prayer. Because when you feel trapped, you feel helpless. And so as you cry out to God and go read the Psalms, you see over and over and over again, David praying, Lord, hear my prayer, hear my cry. And you see the intensity of David's prayer. So look, you want to pray for deliverance? 
pray fervently. All right, pray fervently. I want to give you a, a second way to pray. Pray believing. Not only should we pray fervently, we should also pray believing. Let's, let's continue reading. Acts uh, 12, verse 6, when Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell, striking Peter on the side. I, I, I wonder how that went. Like, Psh, get up, boy. Uh, he woke him up and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. And he did. Wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed. And he did not know that the angel, uh, he did not know that what the angel did was really happening. But he thought he was seeing a vision. And after they passed the first and second guards, that's amazing, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them by itself. That's amazing. Uh, they went outside and passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. He's saying, look, now I know for sure this was God who delivered me, not myself. It wasn't anything that I did. He has rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many um, had assembled and were doing what? And were praying. Now, if we go back to verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was doing what? Praying fervently. So now he is out, and he goes to the house of Mary. And what's the church doing at the house of Mary? They are praying. Question, what do you think they're praying for? They're praying for Peter. God, deliver him. God, do the miraculous. God, do what only you can do. Verse 13, he knocked on the door of the outer gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in, ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. Verse 15, God has answered our prayer, they told her. <laughs> Is that what they said? No. What did they say? You're out of your mind. You're crazy, Rhoda. Leave us alone. We're praying. Dear God, please deliver Peter. We ask you in the name of Jesus to do only what you can do. No, 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 seriously. Peter is outside. Come on, Rhoda. Quit interrupting us. We're in prayer. <laughs> but she kept insisting. Insisting. That means persistent. So what happens when you are persistent? Well, now they got to do something about it. She was, she was insisting that it was true, and they said, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking. <laughs> Consist he's, he's being like, <laughs> he's not giving up. Rhoda's not giving up. Nobody's giving up. Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were amazed. Look, you can't make, like, Who writes this? <laughs> God, like, if you wonder, is the Bible written by people? And yes, there were human authors that God used. But look, man, God writes this. If you're writing this story, this is not how we write it. This is not how we write it. But this was real life. And I want you to see this, this prayer of believing. You know what the difference of a, between a prayer and a believing prayer is? There's one word. It's the word action. A believing prayer says, we're going to pray this, and, and if you tell us that Peter's at the door, man, we're, we're believing. We're going to act on that. And here's how that might look like in your life. You, you might be praying for someone to receive Christ, but if you truly believe that prayer, then guess what? You will follow that up with action of sharing the gospel with them. Believing prayer is always connected with our action. So let me ask you, as Ben comes, what are you praying for? What are you praying for? Do you realize today that prayer is the key that unlocks the door of deliverance? Do you realize today that in God's playbook, you are never trapped? He's the one who delivers. But it is our prayers lifted up to him fervently, persistently, 
not giving up. Listen, I don't, maybe you're here today and there's something going on in your life and you're like, I'm, I'm just ready to give up. I'm just ready to quit the, the thing. I'm, I'm ready to, to quit the pursuit. I'm ready to quit the calling. I'm ready to give up on so and so. Look, look, look. Be persistent. And let that persistence start with your prayers. With every head bowed, with every eye closed. And if you're, if you're watching online, this is, this is for you. Uh, this is for you as well. But no one, no one looking around. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask and invite. If, if you would say, hey, today, Andy, I, I need prayers. There's a, there's a, part of my life that just feels helpless, that feels stuck, that feels trapped, or something that I, that I desire that just doesn't seem to happen. On, on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hands. One, two, three. Anybody? Thank you. At home, is that you? Hands are going up all over the room. God, I, we come praying, asking, believing, persistently. God, there's things in the world and we, we live in an imperfect world imperfect people imperfect circumstances but God deep down our, our hearts desire this, this perfection and God we know that, that here on, on the earth that is it's just not going to happen even Adam who lived in a perfect world made an imperfect decision but God we come recognizing today that Jesus Christ he was perfect in every way, living in an imperfect world. And so we recognize our desperate need for you. God, as hands have, have gone up, I don't, I don't know um, how to articulate those different chains that someone might be feeling or they feel like they're locked in or they're imprisoned. But God, I pray that today would be a, a, a source of encouragement and hope. God, as you whisper to them that, that you are encamped around them and just like you did for Israel in the Old Testament and the Savior and just like Paul encourages us throughout his word the deliverance is just a moment away and that's our hope today that's our hope it's not in us it's not in our strength it's not in it's not in more knowledge God it's not even in other people our hope is in you and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, 